Hi and welcome to our second mini lecture series. This mini lecture series is on the historical foundations of management. So where are we up to? Well in our last series we talked about the contemporary workplace in an effort to introduce management to you. In this mini lecture series we talk about the history of management. Now why talk about the history? Well, if you don't know where you've come, you can't improve on where we are today or even understand where some of our core concepts come from. And what we tend to find, if we don't understand what we were doing before, then we make some critical errors in what we do now. So understanding history is our way of learning where core things have come from and how we can contemporize them today. So the idea of this particular mini lecture um, is what I want you to do is list the management lessons from the classical managerial thinking. Now, as I mentioned, we look backwards for a number of reasons, but in life we do the same thing. So our idea is that we don't reinvent the wheel and in fact, in fact, what we do do is take the best of what we know and update it to reflect current conditions. Right? So we're starting to unpack what this all means how it means and how we can apply it today in an effort to learn from past mistakes. Right? So F.P. Jones actually came out and said, experience is that wonderful thing or marvelous thing that enables you to recognize a mistake when you make it again. Right? So we're constantly making mistakes in life, but experience is what makes it worth it. Right? So we learn from past mistakes in, all, in an effort not to repeat them as we go forward. The great thing about theories is that it can and is challenged all the time. We understand that in the past we did it this way, but now we need to do it this way. And in our first mini lecture series on contemporary nature of work, we learned that life is changing, work is changing, this expectation of work itself in society is changing, and we're in this global networked economy. So our theories and the way in which we enact them in today's organisations need to be adapted, but they don't need to be reinvented. So let's look backwards and start unpacking some of the core lessons from each of the approaches to management. Before we do that, let's start with theory. Now, I know the word theory sometimes conjures up some very high anxiety because it's really hard to get your head around. However, Theories are designed to be an organised way of thinking about a subject. It's designed to simplify things. It's designed to say, okay, um, in life this happens, but how, how do I understand what that is? Right? So the idea is that we're helping to define the concepts about that subject. So if we're talking about truth, we know that truth is out there. right? We all learned that in the movies. However, what that means and who it means to and what are the concepts that underpin truth, for example, are things that need to be unpacked. And that's what theory does. Right? It helps us organise definitions so they don't contradict each other. It helps us explain and predict what's going to happen if we do X and Y. So, for example, the theory is who is suitable to be a leader? Right? Is it, and the concepts underneath that might be height, looks, assertiveness, emotional intelligence, it could be um, location, it could be all of these concepts. And if we put these concepts together, then we start to explain who may be suitable to be a leader. And the great thing about theories is that it learns, it teaches us that we always take our emotions out of everything. Okay, so in organisations, things happen. To make a great decision, you take emotion out and you look at the process, you look at it objectively. How do I do things? Theory forces us to do that. Okay? And in most cases, we use theory every day, we just use it unconsciously. What we're asking you to do in this subject is really start to consciously choose the right theory or the most appropriate theory um, to understand what's going on. So there's multiple approaches to management. In this mini lecture, we focus on the classical approaches. Now, Underpinning our classical approaches to management is that this idea is that people are rational. Yep, people are rational, according to these theorists. So there are three core theories that came out of these approaches. There's the scientific management theory, which was created by Frederick Taylor and Frank and Lillian Gilbreth. There's the administrative principles, and there's the bureaucratic organization. 
So let's start to unpack that. According to Frederick Taylor, management was a science. Okay, so he's the father, he's considered the father of scientific management. And he published the principles of scientific management in 1911. Okay, so what he did was start to unpack what it means to work and how do I get the most efficient thing, the efficient way of working out of people around me. So Taylor, interestingly, came from a really privileged background. He started at Harvard, um, his parents funded his education, but then he decided, I'm done. I don't want to go to Harvard, I want to work. So he dropped out. And he chose to work as a tradesman in a machine shop. And he debunked all of his family expectations and said, no, I'm going to start at the bottom. And he did. And he worked his way up. He rose to be an engineer, and then he rose to be a consulting engineer for management. All right, and this is where all of his principles came from. And his core principles was that in order for the one best way for a job to be done, we have to put the right people on the job with the correct tools and, and equipment. We have to standardize the method of doing the job and we have to provide an economic incentive to the worker, which makes sense, right? And we see this in today's practice. So his principles still remain. I mean, think about it. Here are some of the ways in which it's been um, I guess, implemented. Scientific management emphasizes careful selection and training of workers and supervisory support. We see this in today's society. We see position descriptions, we see ads, we see different ways in which we advertise different jobs. So for example, for a frontline employee who may be um, a baggage handler at an airport, we're not gonna put that ad on seek because we don't expect them to be um, computer literate and we don't require them to be computer literate. In fact, our target pool of workers are people that still use the uh, and read the newspaper or on flyers or on Facebook or somewhere like that. So we carefully select and train the workers. This requires us to invest in our employees. We also invest in our management by providing them with supervision support. Now there are four guiding principles that underpin scientific management. And these are important. The first one is to develop for every job a science that includes standardized work processes and conditions. Now, this is what we call a position description in common day language. We then need to carefully select workers with the right abilities for the job, which is where our um, interviewing and other job selection um, tools and mechanisms are created. We then need to carefully train and incentivize workers. And we see this in organizations where there are workers that are commission-based only, or commissioned with a base salary, or commissioned um, with the base salary and a bonus because they've got the great job. Um, or they might just be on a salary with a couple of bonuses, or they might be on a salary with no bonuses, right? So we're starting to incentivize workers. Motivation um, and motivating workers is really important. We talk about that later in the semester. And our fourth guiding principle is that we support workers with carefully planned work. Now, if we think back to the management science, um, we've got four functions of management, leading, controlling, organizing, and planning. So planning is the way in which we plan for the jobs, but organizing um, or planning our work and distributing tasks is absolutely essential when it comes to scientific management. Now, the issue with some of the approaches that Taylor had actually come out with was that he encouraged time and motion studies. Now, time and motion studies are really good and they do measure productivity. We do that today. Uh, but all of his empirical support came out by getting the most efficient working um, output. Right? So if we think back to contemporary nature of work, we talked about organizations being an open system where there's resource inputs from the environment, the transformation process happens, and then there's outputs that exist. Now, Taylor focused on this transformation period, and what he said was that we can make people more efficient. Right? So if we carefully design jobs with efficient work methods, we can actually improve the outputs that come out in an efficient way. And in his environment, he was an engineer, so he spoke in, in a machine, so he was speaking about 
um, the physical labor task of getting a job done. So lifting heavy weights and putting it into a truck. All right. So when he studied this, what he did was that he measured it on with 12 burly Hungarians over a one um, hour period. Right. So basically he timed it with a marathon by judging times over a 100 meter dash. So this guy um, would pick up his 47.5 tons of um, work, put it in the back of a truck, and then basically if he wasn't going to keep going on that um, particular speed and exertion, augment and physical exertion, then they would, he would have him fired because it was a science and he should be able to, this employee should be able to measure and um, get through 47.5 tons of um, physical labored work in that period of time. Now the challenge is the measurement of this was flawed. Obviously keeping up with um, doing 47.5 tons of heavy weight lifting a day is going to take a physical toll on an employee. Um, and there were some really strong methodological flaws with his study. However, he did make billions of dollars as a consultant with his theory. And time and motion studies are still used today. So regardless of how flawed he's, he came up with these um, theories, they still stick. Right? We still use time and motion studies. I mean, think about the car manufacturing industry. They measure things all the time. We think we look at um, how we're doing our work, and the studies of work itself use time and motion. Right? They measure how much output you do over a period of time in order to increase productivity. We carefully design jobs with efficient work methods all the time. Right? We're always looking at doing um, doing more with less, and we see that as an issue within society. That you know, as managers, that's something that we need to face. We design incentive systems, as I said before, we talked about commission-based or salary-based, and we unpack some more of these in the motivation lecture. Um, and we also train workers and train managers. Now, the challenge with management is that a lot of managers earn their jobs based on their technical skills, not their um, empathetic skills. So we do need to start thinking about how we train supervisors to support workers in order to motivate them to do better. So that's scientific management. Um, and again, part of the a really important part of our history because we still use those principles. So Henry Fayol then came along and said, actually, you know what? I believe that the following rules apply to management. We need to have foresight. We need to have a complete plan of action as to where we're going and how we're going to get there. We need to have organization. We need to provide and mobilize those resources. So in that transformation process, we need to be very careful and meticulous about how we do things in order to get the output that we want. So organization is essential. We also need to command. So we need to lead, select, and evaluate the workers on a regular basis. And we need to coordinate. We need to be able to uh, fit our divisions together and we need to be able to work combined in order to get the best outcome. And lastly, we need to control these things. All right. So. As I'm saying these things to you, you're probably thinking they're really similar to the planning, leading, organizing, controlling approaches, and they are. Henry Fayol started to unpack some of those management principles for us. So planning, for example, requires foresight. All right, leading requires command. Organizing required organization and coordinating, and control is the same as control. Okay. So this is where some of those management processes actually came from. And we see this in everyday practice. So according to Henry Fayol, the manage is to forecast, to manage is to forecast and plan, to organize, to command, to coordinate, and to control. And we still take those principles on today. But what he said was that there were 14 principles that we needed to think about. There were the scalar chain principle, where there should be a clear and unbroken line of communication from top to bottom. Now, we've all heard of Chinese whispers, right? <coughs> Sometimes communication fails, but the scalar chain principle still upholds that we need to find a way to communicate effectively in order to do good jobs or good output. There's this unity of command principle. 
So each person should receive orders from only one boss. Makes sense. However, in today we also find that given that we're globally networked, that doesn't always hold up. So in some industries, absolutely. However, in others, <coughs> a matrix structure is actually more appropriate. The unity of direction principle that underpins fail, uh, well, that fail said that underpinned management, was that one person should be in charge of all activities that have the same performance objectives. All right. So we're starting to really start to unpack what it means to be a manager, who's in charge, where are they in charge of, how do we measure that accountability? So there are the, um, some of the principles. Now, as I said, there were 14 of them, but they were uh, those three were the ones in which um, have a clear link to the way in which we organise work today. Max Weber then came along and said, you know what, no, People are rational human beings and our organization should be the same. All right, so an ideal, rational and efficient form of organization is founded on logic, order and legitimate authority. All right, so I can define a bureaucratic organization by one with clear division of labor, clear hierarchy of authority, clear formal rules and procedures, impersonality and careers based on merit. Makes perfect sense. It's A, B, C. Full stop. Now we see bureaucracy in organisations and we know, I mean, think about the hospital system, think about Queensland Health, think about government, right? There is always a form for everything. Now bureaucracy has its place, right? In some industries, bureaucracy is the gold standard. However, it's not for all. So organisations in today's society actually have to unpack what elements of this are relevant and what elements aren't. But if we're looking at a rational human logic, bureaucracy was founded as a result of the classical approach of management. So historical approaches to management reflect contexts that produce the same systems today. All right, the classical approaches really talk about, okay, there are one best way to manage because everyone is a rational human being. And right there you see the flaw. Right? We're not rational. The fundamental flaw of human condition is that we're irrational. Right? We're not always predictable. Some are, some aren't. Um, and that's, I guess, if we're looking at unpacking the lessons in management, there is no one way, best way to manage. However, there are best ways to manage, depending on your industry, depending on your sectors, depending on everything else. And this is where different approaches to management started to unpack. So in our me next mini lecture, we're actually going to start talking about the behavioural approaches to management because they're different to the classical approaches. So the classical approaches to, uh, in this mini lecture focused on humans as rational creatures. The behavioural approaches start to think differently. I'll see you soon.